This is Romans 3, verses 21 through 31. And the word of God reads as thus. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Verse 22. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and, and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. That is the reading of God's word. Great. Thank you very much, Warner. And it's been brilliant to have you around uh, in the church over these last few days. And uh, thank you for speaking at the school as well as at Real Lives and uh, this evening too. That's fantastic. My name is John Ridsbridger. I'm one of the ministers here and going to spend a little while trying to open up this, uh, this passage that Warner's just read to us. So it'd be great if you could have it in front of you and then you can follow through on uh, what we're exploring I want to begin with that famous phrase from Apple, think different. You've probably seen that in their publicity. It was the famous slogan that the, the, the Apple company launched at the turn of the millennium. But it wasn't just a slogan. It was the vision, the, the ethos of the company, which set their kind of culture of innovation that catapulted Apple, really, into the world's leading company, which it still was in May of of 2019. Phenomenal success. Think different, they say. At a uh, recent college graduation speech, uh, their CEO, the current CEO, Tim Cook, put it like this. He said, the greatest challenge of life is knowing when to break with conventional wisdom. Don't just accept the world you inherit today. Don't just accept the status quo. No big challenge has ever been solved and no lasting improvement has ever been achieved unless people dare to try something different. Dare to think different. Dare to think different. That's what I want us to do, what I'm asking all of us to do here this evening, to think different and to think different about what I think is one of the most important issues in life, which is the whole issue of how we find acceptance as human beings. You might say that feels a bit soft and fluffy, but hang on, this is really important for most of us. We want to feel we belong. We want to feel we're accepted. That might be about accepting ourselves. It might be about being accepted by other people. But we want to feel accepted. And yet the reality is, most of the time, we're not really sure that we are. What do we do about that? Well, some of us just drive ourselves harder and harder to prove ourselves, hoping that that will make us feel accepted acceptable to others, acceptable to ourselves. Others of us just kind of shrivel up into a little ball and say, I'm never going to get that, so I'll just stay secure with the people that I feel safe with. We need to belong. We need to feel accepted. But here's my question. What if we were made for more than that? What if our desire for being accepted 
is like a kind of built-in GPS system right there embedded in our humanity that's pointing us to a bigger order of acceptance. An acceptance that goes way beyond either our unreliable hearts and what we think about ourselves or beyond the fickle opinions of other people that go hot and cold on us. What if there's a bigger picture of how we find acceptance? What if the acceptance that really counts for us is actually acceptance with God our creator, if there is a God? I want you just to think about that possibility. And then to ask the question, okay, let's suppose that actually we were made for this relationship with God where we know that we belong to him, we know we're accepted by him, but here's the problem. How on earth do we find that relationship? How on earth do we find a place of knowing that the God of the universe really accepts us? Well, most of us answer that question in the same way that we do in all the rest of our relationships. How do you get accepted by God? You do a load of stuff. You might do a load of religious stuff because God's meant to like religion, isn't he? Or you might do a lot of kind of good cause kind of stuff. One way or another, we're going to be a good person and hope that God will accept us. But tonight I want to challenge us to think different about that whole issue. Because that's exactly what Paul is saying in this passage we need to do. We need to think different about how we can find acceptance with God. Have a look at the first verse. He says, Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. Apart from the law. Paul says we need to think different to see a way of being accepted by God. Not by what we do, apart from the law, but by putting our trust in what Jesus has done for us. Verse 21 again. The, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness, this being accepted by God, is given through faith in Jesus to all who believe. I wonder if you were here last week for the first of our uh, Real Lives events. And we had that brilliant interview with Rahil Patel. Rahil is a, uh, well, he was a senior Hindu priest and he became a Christian. And partway through his interview, he gave this amazing summary of the difference between the way he used to think about religion and what he discovered Jesus could do for him. Just watch the screen and we'll get two or three minutes of that interview, hopefully, if the technology works. However good of a person you are, you are always making a flaw or, or mistake somewhere. So, even in that hard effort of doing good karma, there's always going to be guilt and shame attached. Because you never make the mark. So again, you continue in that circle, just working hard and hard like a slave. So in that guilt and shame, spiritually, you never feel loved by God because you're always looking at your flaws and what's not good because you're always trying to do good karma does that does that make yeah. sense yeah so then because you're always in guilt and shame because you can't really 100% perform you start doing that ritual you start doing this pilgrimage you start reading that scripture you start offering money at that temple, you start offering flowers at that temple to yeah. atone for that, but that never changes. So that always continues. And then you're in this cycle, but you don't know you're in a cycle because it's core to the fundamental belief of any Hindu. Does, does that make yeah. sense? And in the contrast the there... Con the contrast is, is incredibly stark. Incredibly stark. Like I said, it took me two years to deconstruct here this idea that I don't have to prove myself to God. I don't have to please him. When I first came to Christ, I thought, okay, now what do I do? Shall I do this course, that Bible college? Which team shall I help in? Which... And God was very clear in the very beginning. He said, look, the sole purpose of your life is to be loved by me as you are. Just learn how to be loved as you are. That took me two years 
to, 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 to sort of settle in my heart. So in Christ, you know, all your sins are cleaned. That happened on the cross. Yeah. The, the cross is very, very significant. You know, that, that's the sort of ultimate act of grace, of love. Yeah. That, that's the sacrifice. What, when you look at all the Hindu scriptures, they are central. One of the central practices is sacrifice. You know, when you look at all the rituals in detail, it's about sacrifice. And this sacrifice has done it all. And that, that's the hot stark difference that I don't do it, he's done it for me. Mm. You know, it's the ultimate sacrifice. You don't work your way to him. Mm. You don't earn his love. That, that's, the, that's the difference. Great. We'll cut there. Thank you. I can't actually think of a better way of summarizing everything that's in this passage this evening than that story by Raheel. That, that experience he had of being like a slave, just cycling round and round and round, trying to do more and more and more, but never knowing that God loved him. And then discovering that in Jesus Christ, he could be totally accepted, not because of what he did, but because of what Jesus had done for him. And that's what the passage is all about this evening. Let me just summarize in a couple of headings. First of all, we're in it together, verses 22 to 24. A few years ago, you may have heard that story of the, uh, the Chilean miners who got trapped 700 meters underground after a collapse in a copper mine. And uh, there's this amazing kind of drama of human solidarity and Christian faith that unfolded as those 33 men supported each other through their 70-day ordeal. One of the miners, Mario, someone or another, said, we knew that if society broke down, we would all be doomed. Every day a different person took a bad turn, but every time that happened, we worked as a team to try and keep the morale up. They were in it together, stuck in the same predicament together, and in the end they got out together as shafts were drilled down 700 meters into the earth and they were lifted up. Massive celebration. In the same predicament together and the same way out together. In it together. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here at the beginning of this passage. Romans 1 to 3 has exposed the failure of atheism, chapter 1, but also the failure of rules-based religion, chapters 2 and 3. Neither of them work. That's the conclusion we got to at the end of last week. And so you get this really, really stark conclusion. We're in the mess together, verse 22 in the middle. There's no difference between Jew, the religious people, Gentile, the non-religious people, because all of us have sins and fallen short of the glory of God. We're in this together. I'm in it too. You're in it. Everyone is in it. We're in it together. He's saying, look, human beings were made for something absolutely wonderful. He calls it the glory of God here. We were made to reflect the glory of God gleamingly, brilliantly in the world, to look after it, to look after each other, and to be free in his lavish love and generosity. That's what we were made for, for glory, something amazing. But he said, we've all blown it. We've all fallen short of that glory. We're guilty. We're messed up. We're separated from God and we're in it together. But thankfully it doesn't stop there. Verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We're in the mess together, but there's a way out together that we share as well. This is like the diamond on the dark cloth, the first light of dawn after a long dark night. A way out of this predicament that we're in as human beings. The, the words are a little bit dense here, but somebody said that these verses here, in fact, Martin Luther, one of the great thinkers of the church, said these verses are the most important verses in the whole of the Bible. So just stay with it, okay? A bit dense, but let me just try and quickly unpack them to you. He says, first of all, all of us are justified. That means Declared righteous, declared acceptable in the sight of God. How does that happen? Well, the second word is the word grace. It happens not because we earn it, not because we prove ourselves, but just because God is good and kind. He gives us what we don't deserve. 
That's what grace means. And he did it through the redemption. There's the third word that came through Christ Jesus. Redemption just means bringing somebody back who was lost by paying a price for them. In other words, we were all in a mess, but a fantastic price has been paid to bring us back to the glory of God, what we were made for. But here's a question. How come when we have messed up and fallen so far short, which I have and I think all of us have, how come that God can freely and fully accept us? How is that even right? I mean, how's that just? Well, that's the next section, verses 25 and 26, which I'm going to call just love. Verse 25 says this, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. Let me give you a story to try and unpack what that means. I recently read that book by Louis de Bernier called Captain Corelli's Mandarin. Mandolin. And uh, you may have you may have read the story. In it, Corelli and his huge friend, Carlo Guecchio, are Italian soldiers. And they're in a Nazi and Italian joint force occupying the little uh, Greek island of Kefalonia in the Second World War. But towards the end of the war, the Italians join with the Allies and against the Germans. And as a result, the Nazi soldiers on the island of Kefalonia decide that they're going to execute all of their previous Italian comrades, including Captain Corelli and Carlo Guecchio. So uh, the time comes when they're going to face the bullets. And Corelli and Carlo are standing next to each other, ready to have their bodies riddled with German bullets. But, and I quote, what no one had seen was at the order to fire... Carlo stepped smartly sideways like a soldier forming ranks. Antonio Corelli found in front of him the titanic bulk of Carlo Guerce, found his wrists gripped painfully in those mighty fists, found himself unable to move. And Carlo stood unbroken as one bullet after another burrowed like what height parasitic knives into the muscle of his chest. Carlo looked up at the sky, felt the bullet cave the jawbone of his face and flung himself over backwards. Corelli lay beneath him, paralyzed by his weight, drenched utterly in his blood and stupefied by an act of love so incomprehensible and ineffable, so filled with divine madness. Carlo Guecchio had stood in front of Corelli And taken all the bullets for him. So that Carlo died and Corelli could live. That's what Christianity is all about. Verse 25 again. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. Again, just zoom in closely on the detail for a moment. Jesus offers himself as a sacrifice for our forgiveness... Who did this? Who made the sacrifice? Well, it says, verse 25, God made it. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Have you ever thought how weird that is? Every other sacrifice that has ever been made to God has been made by a human being to God. But this sacrifice is totally unique. This is God offering a sacrifice to God. God did it. That's kind of odd. He paid, not us. This is like a total rethink on religion. Not what we do for God, but what he's done for us. He paid. But what exactly did he do? Well, it says here, he gave his son Jesus as a sacrifice for us. And the word here is a word that clever people have lost a lot of sleep over. Okay, And I'm not clever enough to lose much sleep over it. But let me just kind of summarize where it says sacrifice of atonement here. At its heart, it's about anger being turned away. Anger being turned away. Let me try and explain I want you to imagine you're on a volcano and it suddenly starts to erupt and the lava flow is coming down the hill in your direction, okay? But it just happens that on this volcano you have a JCB 
and some of those big concrete barriers they put out in London to keep us safe from the terrorists, okay? And the lava flow is coming towards you, but with your JCB, you pick up two or three of these massive concrete barriers and you put them in front of you. The lava flow is coming down towards you, but it hits the barriers and it gets diverted and you are safe because the barriers have been hit instead of you. That's the image here. It's pretty shocking, I know, but the first three chapters of Romans have told us bluntly, as we've already reflected, that we have blown it with God. We pushed him away. We put ourselves in his place. We pretty much ignored him. We've imagined that we can bargain our way back to him, which we can't. And God is just and righteous. He is angry at what we've done. You might say, John, I can't handle the idea of God who gets angry. Don't you ever get angry? Don't you ever get angry when you see something really wrong? And when you do see something really wrong and it makes you angry, do you think it's wrong to get angry? When you hear about six million Jews killed in the Holocaust and you feel angry, do you think, oh, I really shouldn't feel angry about that? It's fine. It's not fine, is it? It's right to feel angry in the face of evil and injustice. Well, if it's right for us, How much more right is it for God to be outraged by human evil and rebellion? That's the reality. God is angry. He's not indifferent to the mess that we've made of his world. So if we're going to get exactly what we deserve, friends, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. It's as if the lava of God's judgment is flowing towards us. But on the cross, Jesus put himself in the way of it. Jesus became the barrier that would shield us from that lava of judgment and turn it away so that we could be forgiven and set free. That's the image here when it talks about Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement. The anger that was due to come to us was diverted and he took it on himself instead so that we could go free and be utterly and totally forgiven. Friends, this is absolutely amazing stuff. It's stunning. And it isn't like there's kind of God there, us there, and kind of Jesus as a third party over here who unfortunately gets punished for us. Now, Romans has already told us that Jesus is God in human flesh. So what's happening on the cross is that God himself is stepping in for us. God is choosing to take his own anger into himself for us so that it can be turned away from us. That's what it cost God to forgive us. It literally tore the Trinity apart on the cross. Have you ever found forgiveness hard? If you haven't, you've not had to forgive very much. It is one of the hardest things to do. That decision to stop pouring out your anger on somebody who has hurt you and just take it into yourself instead. It's hard. It's really hard. And God knows it's hard too. That's what the cross is about. How do we experience all this for ourselves? Well, we've got to keep thinking differently if we're going to get this. Verse 25, God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. We've looked at that. To be received by faith. No boxes to tick. No hoops to jump through. No list of rules that we suddenly have to sort out first. No, just invest your trust in Jesus and what he's done. That's all. And because what he's done is perfect and complete, you and I can be secure and at peace. We can know for sure and forever that God has has accepted us. Because it doesn't depend on us. It depends on Jesus and his work is perfect. That's something that can really set you free. Why did he do it? There's the last bit of the argument, really. Well, of course he did it because he loved us, yeah? 
Absolutely. You, you would never do that for someone you didn't love incredibly powerfully, would you? You can definitely look at the cross and see the love of God in action, blisteringly powerful and strong. But there's more. God's love is just love. It's holy love. So at the end of verse 25, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness, his justice. Because in his patience, he had left the sins beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. He did it to show his justice. You see, if there is no punishment for our wrongdoing then the judge of all the earth is saying it doesn't matter. And that's a lie, because it does matter. God is just. God is righteous. So on the cross, evil is punished. A price is paid. But God is also love. And so he chooses to take the punishment for us, to pay the price instead of us. A bit like a judge in a court imposing a huge fine and then stepping out and standing beside the the person who's just been convicted, opening his checkbook and writing a check to settle the debt for him. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He paid it so that justice is satisfied, but our lives can be thrown open to the amazing love of God. This is such good news. It means that God isn't just choosing to forget the rubbish and rebellion in our lives. To be honest, that wouldn't help me very much. God just saying, oh yeah, I I don't think about that anymore. Hang on, what if he starts thinking about it again? It's not good enough. It doesn't work. But that isn't what the cross is about. The cross is telling us instead, he has dealt with it. He has paid for it. He has punished it. So if you have invested your trust in Jesus, he will never ask you to pay for it again. Because that would be unjust. It's gone. Forever and for sure. So if your trust is in Jesus, you are free. You are forgiven. You are totally accepted by the God of the universe so you can stand up tall and embrace the life that he's given you. Just love. What does it look like when we stand up tall and embrace that love? Two quick things that Paul finishes with. First of all, it means no boasting. Verse 27, where then is boasting? It's excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? Now, is it just law against boasting? No, Is because of the law that requires faith. Because we maintain a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Boasting is what we put our confidence in. The things we achieve, the impact we make, the popularity we enjoy. Makes us feel secure. And those things make us feel kind of acceptable. But you cannot boast before the cross of Jesus. Because the cross tells us that we did nothing to be accepted by God. God had to do it all for us, and therefore no boasting. Tim Keller says, to boast in our achievement is like a drowning man clutching a fistful of hundred-dollar bills and shouting, I'm okay, I've got money. Doesn't work, no boasting, but instead, white-hot praise and deep thankfulness. And second, no limits, verses 29 and 30. You see, The world of the first century was split in two for most people in Israel. There were Jewish people and there were Gentile, non-Jewish people. The Jewish people who had God's law were very religious and practiced male circumcision as as the sign of their faith. And then the Gentile people who weren't so religious and didn't have the law and were basically pagans. In our terms, there were the religious people and the irreligious people, even the atheists. So... We know, don't we? God is on the side of the religious ones, surely. That's what people thought then, and it's what people think now. But the Bible says no. Being accepted by God doesn't happen through religion. It happens simply through faith, trusting what Jesus has done. And that's the same for us all. Whether you're naturally religious or you can't stand religion, it's the same for us all. Verse 29, is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. 
Since there's only one God who will justify, rescue, make acceptable the circumcised, that's the Jewish, by faith, and the uncircumcised, the rest, through that same faith. You may wear branded clothes. You may have your arms inked with tattoos. You may have been a Sunday school kid. Or you may only have ever used Jesus' name to swear. You might be very British, or you might be someone who's come from far away here with only the clothes you were standing up in. You may be straight, you may be gay, you may be married, single, divorced. You may be sleeping in a hostel or owning a mansion. There are no limits. Jesus is for you, and we want to help you get to know him. He'll change you from the inside just as he's still changing me years on. But he loves you like you've never been loved before. After all, who else do you know who volunteered to die for you? So this evening, I want to challenge you and invite you. Dare to think different. Dare to give up on rule-obsessed religion And on God denying atheism. Dare to live for God's approval rather than the approval of others. And dare to believe that you can have that approval for free because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, shall we, as we respond. And maybe you came here this evening as someone who really wasn't interested in Christianity. You're quite sure religion isn't for you. But something about Jesus has just been prizing open your heart. I want to encourage you in the quiet to reach out to him. As Warner said to us before, it isn't about religion and church and Christianity. It's about Jesus, and he's here before you, wanting to show himself. Ask him to speak to him. Maybe actually you're in that place where you're ready to put your faith in Jesus and become a Christian. Tom or I would love to speak with you afterwards and just help you think through how you can take that step. Or maybe you're someone who, you are a Christian, but you've lost your way. You started focusing on proving yourself. And everything's going into what you do and what you are, rather than what Jesus has done. And it's time to turn around and come back and humble yourself before the cross of Jesus. Lord Jesus, whoever we are, whatever our background, we want to kneel before your cross. The place where you died for us, where you stood in the way to take away the judgment that we deserve so that we could be free and forgiven. We put our trust in you. We love you. We want to follow you. And we want to help so many other people in our city get to know you too. Please receive us. And please help us to walk from here as free people. Tom's going to lead us on.